Here we go, Tim. We're back. Last week we talked mesocycles. This week we're expanding out talking microcycles. So what is a microcycle or macrocycle macro, rather? Macro, yeah. yeah so macro. the opposite of micro, yeah, we got macro. So macrocycle is essentially a cluster of mesocycles. And I think when you think about these things in terms of fractals, right, what we've been talking about from a ac exercise to the reps, to the sets, to the time under tension, to the intensity. And then we look at the training session and how that, that fr fractals out to a a microcycle and then a mesocycle, which is a collection of microcycles. And then we look at finally the macrocycle. And one thing hopefully has been coming across pretty clearly is that they all have a certain level of connectedness. And when we look at a individual rep or time and retention per rep, you know, that should have some sort of harmony with what we're trying to accomplish overall in a macro view. Uh, and that's the whole premise of fractal mathematics is that What's true on a microscopic level will be true on a macroscopic level. And the, the simplest definition of fractals is simple rules repeated, where if we look at it from this disjointed connection, right? The, hey, this rep or this set or the intensity or the training session focus or the microcycle focus or the mesocycle focus isn't in conjunction with the macrocycle. One of those things would have a massive concentric circle off it. And, I know this might seem like it's very, very like, how should I say, theoretical and not really actually saying anything tangible. But one thing that I find is so abundantly clear when I look at program design is this simple, well, what are we trying to do here? And I think some sort of inconsistencies, right? It's like when you're writing and you see like a tangent that's not really related to the, to the plot or the subtext or just anything of that nature. And you're like, what was the point of that? That was just fluff. And I yeah. think it's a lot of times we're looking at programming, right? Like, you know, just throwing in unnecessary trivial things or having things that are disjointed from the overall grand scheme of things. Like, yeah, there's always going to be amendments to the plan, but intentionally programming random into a, into a macro cycle is, it seems unnecessary, right? There's going to be enough random inserted into it in general. So having a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish on a microscopic and a macroscopic level makes a lot of sense. But when we're looking at the macro cycle, that is the, that is the classic view and approach from like Matiev all the way through to Verkashenky and Zatiarsky. And then looking at a guy like Isseran who came up with block periodization. All of this stems from Hans Eli's general adaptation syndrome. This looking at of like applying some sort of stress, it creates a reaction. We either go into adaptation or alarm. And this like thought that we can organize stress in a systematic way to accumulate and aggregate into something better off than if we didn't apply that stress. Like the whole premise of hormesis is this idea that stress is either a poison or an antidote, and we just need to figure out how to pick the optimal amount of dosage and the optimal amount of frequency in order to get the outcome that we want of adaptive immunity. Same thing for training response. And when we break down a like macro view, it's just systematically applying stress on a microscopic level, which is why it's so important to have a, a connecting this to the overall goal, right? Like giving someone a random poison like arsenic, just because it's, I want to see if they can adapt to that while we're trying to get them to adapt to some sort of virus. Well, it, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And when we're thinking about hormesis, we're thinking about general adaptation syndrome, we're thinking about the other el element of the equation of looking at fitness fatigue. And ultimately it just comes down to this relationship or ratio between fitness and fatigue into this aggregate outcome. And that's why it was so important. If you're like struggling with this concept, or if you don't really know what I'm talking about, go all the way back to episode one of setting really tangible goals and having a perspective of what is this person asking me to do for them? What is it that they need me to facilitate here? And how important is it that we stick to that plan? And when we actually get down boots to the ground and we execute on this, it's going to be more and more important that we actually have some sort of backbone when they are not doing it as we actually designed or positioned. And there is a choice in every single situation. I can emphasize a certain thing of this needs to be done a certain way at a certain pace or intensity, or I can tolerate things that aren't necessarily in conjunction with that. And we get a random ad hoc outcome versus all right, in that moment, as a coach, I have a plan. Plan makes sense. Plan is agreed upon and understood. And the client or the athlete is choosing not to comply with that plan. I need to insert myself in making sure that this is their goal. This is what they're trying to accomplish. And on this sing singular moment where they're not feeling great or 
they don't really understand the greater scheme of things or the honeymoon effect of training is gone and they no longer are interested or as motivated. That's where you really hold your weight and having a long-term view. I know where the end, I know what point B is supposed to be. And I know what we're supposed to be when we get there on that short term Thursday in a random week six that you don't really know what the point is, relatively speaking to the beginning or the end. That's where it's most important. And that's why periodization never going to die because the truth is, is it gives some sort of onus and responsibility to the coach to hold you to some sort of standard. And yes, like. Any real coach would tell you that that plan is going to change, but it's the man in the arena. When we talk about periodization, it's having the courage to create a hypothesis and say, okay, I, I'm going to form an experiment off that hypothesis of a certain amount of variables with a certain amount of exercises, with a certain frequency and organizing that over a course of four, eight, 12 week periods. And yeah, like I want to at least come through on that point and saying, is this something that I was really well thought out or understood? And I'm at that critical juncture where compliance and execution are going to be challenged and they're choosing not to do it. What is my decision on that? And if I choose to let them do it incorrectly or not in line with what we asked them to do, or if there's a bunch of random ad hoc things thrown in there that are unnecessary and trivial, then yeah, I'm going to have some sort of unpredictable outcome. And then you could say at that point, well, what's the point of periodizing? I would say equally in that moment, what would be the point of coaching? What would be the point of anything? What's the point if you don't really believe in what you're doing? And that's, I mean plug here, but we get into that foundations course. It's such a, it's so central to what I try to accomplish with every coach. It's if you don't believe with what we do matters and don't do it, do something that will matter. Like, mm -hmm. cause the truth of the matter is, is like people are paying you to do something they can or won't. They don't want to hear what you say is trivial or unnecessary, meaningless. Cause that, that doesn't help anyone because they're in, they, they can't do it or they won't do it. So therefore your value prop is figuring out how to get them to do it or have the ability to do it. And if you can't do that or won't do that because you don't believe in what we do, do something else. But I, the point of periodization and the, the pundits out there saying that it's why, well, you know, it's kind of a little bit overstated or over uh, emphasized. Yeah, probably because you, you suck in that juncture where it actually really makes a difference to hold to a plan. Like, just to be completely honest, like you can tell me trivial things like, oh, wow, like, yeah, it's important to be random and chaotic because that's the world around them. Like, yeah, sure. But training is, is very pragmatic and training has some sort of linear focus. I know if I do a set of eight with 30 to 40 seconds of time and retention, I'm just going to create some sort of change on that muscular tissue. I know that it's proven. It's, it's not a, it's not anecdotal. It's completely evidence-based. Like we have enough research and data points to do that. And if I need to increase lean muscle mass, because that is the part of the bigger plan. And in that moment, I choose to then let them go with a maybe altered time and retention or a shortened range of motion or change your position that changes the line of tension or the pull on that muscle because it's just more convenient or I just don't want to have that argument or that discussion. It means you're a shitty coach and the periodization wasn't wrong. It was just a coaching. Like the coaching needs to get better. They have a mutual relationship. The ability to coach something on a microscopic level and a macroscopic level is always connected. And the ones that lose sight of that are the ones who probably become disenfranchised with something like periodization and struggle to get the outcome that they want because in those critical junctures, they just don't even have the ability to do it. Or on the other end of it, they're too focused on that more, that, that moment to moment, and they're not seeing the bigger picture and their, their outcomes are random because they don't really have a perspective of planning and organizing their stuff in a logical sequence, what manner to get to the outcome. And there's always these intersections, right? That's like your facility, your equipment, the athlete, you know, as Newell described, task environment and, and organism. And having the ability to manage constraints within that makes a big difference. I and mean, we could look at the Knuffer never network. We're looking at simple, complex, complicated, and all these things kind of interchangeable with, with program design and, and this truth of the matter of organizing really chaotic environments and open, open energy derived from the outside world system uh, that it becomes very hard to say, okay, like what we do doesn't make a difference, but on the other end of it, I would come back and say, it's the ones that realize can make a difference and the ones that can hold them to a standard, the ones that have the conviction and the, and the belief that what they do actually matters. are probably going to get a lot from actually periodizing and organizing the programming. Very long opening, by the way, on that yeah, one. No, see, it was great. I mean, we could certainly go down a whole rabbit hole, like what to do when, when, you know, the program's not being followed. How do you alter that? How do you adjust that? But 
to bring it back to, to the macro cycle conversation, we know the end, we know where we're going. How do we organize those mesos in a way that actually gets us to that end point that we talked about way out in week one? Yeah, well, I'll go back to the central premise of conjugate for cowards, right? We know that at this point. Should never forget uh, that. Because it's like, well, what does it lead to? Are you going to do 12 weeks of conjugate nonlinear periodization? I just don't get it. Like, I, I just 12 weeks of that, right? Just micro hitting power and or velocity and power and strength and muscular endurance and hitting it over and over and over again and just prioritizing like muscular endurance to the lowest level. Let's say that is the biggest fundamental need. Right. Or let's say that's something they need to peak with. Like, I, I get it. Most things are going to peak with some sort of velocity or power, which is the traditional outcome that we've all are probably striving for. That's the grail. And we try to increase strength to increase a reserve of power. Right. Or we try to increase muscular endurance to be able to do or tolerate higher levels of strength within a training session. But this like micro hitting of always, always slamming just everything all at once. I just struggle with that. So when we look at like a progression from one mesocycle to the next, you know, a lot of the th stuff that I'm going to talk about is based off a of saturated volume or intensity based schematic. And, you know, the, the central, pr the central premise of block periodization is either stress through volume or stress through intensity, meaning that I'm going to focus more on intensity, this above 85% RM or these below six reps of your one RM or six and six and below in terms of rep schemes, or maybe 20 seconds and below in terms of time and retention. And then we look at the other end of it, stress through volume, and that gets into potential pathways that are more muscular endurance or hypertrophy, this eight to 12 or 12 to 20 rep range, this intensity that's probably this 55 to 75% range, and then this time of retention of 40 and up, right? And we look at that from the two split down the middle. All right, I have a intensity, I have a volume-based approach, and they traditionally, in terms of block periodization, undulate. And we go from a volume to an intensity, a volume to intensity. Now, with that being said, is there's got to be some sort of rationale as to why I progress from one volume to another one. And you think about the, the four big qualities between relative strength, functional hypertrophy, hypertrophy, and muscular endurance that all of the schematic, those big four, you know, what, are, what of those four are gonna have the biggest systemic impact, right? If they need to improve their relative strength, you know, maybe we need to think about it, maybe a two to one relative strength to functional hypertrophy type of arrangement from intensification standpoint. If I'm thinking about it from a, they need to increase muscular size as opposed to muscular endurance, maybe I think, I think I need to be like a two to one hypertrophy to muscular endurance. Now, on the other end of it, though, like if I need to get two, let's say, relative strength and two much hypertrophy type of training blocks within a, a macro cycle to get to a outcome that is favorable for that athlete, when do I need to time the muscular endurance and when do I need to time that functional hypertrophy to get to some sort of outcome? And when we start to think about like that building of muscle tissue or that building of strength or the building of muscular endurance or maybe the building of actual myofibral strength. Then I started thinking about organizing and ordering my mesocycles to get that peak from whatever it is I want. And that's the whole premise of block periodization is looking at the end, like let's say a, a 1600 meter runner, what are the bioenergetic things that that person needs to have in place from an inventory or needs analysis we do? And it could be slow. It could be poor fitness. And you start to organize and layer your, your training blocks to get to that peak improved 1600 meter time. In a team sport, it's not that, that perfect. And I agree that some folks would argue that why a mixed approach of dynamic effort relative, or, or max effort and, and repeated effort would make more sense from that. But I would look at it from human beings get pretty bored and disinterested and stuff. It feels like it's monotonous and, and overwhelming and really boring, uh, where at least the block periodization gives at least an opportunity to focus on something, carpentmentalize the goal, and just say, this is our, our task for the next two to four weeks, and let's go to work. And that's where I would come back and saying, adjusting the length of the mesocycle, instead of going four weeks, you can go two weeks, especially if it's a quality that you don't necessarily need to hammer or pin down for an extended period of time. But in terms of the transition, we're either going to go from a relative strength to a hypertrophy or a functional hypertrophy to a muscular endurance to make that transition a little less. And what you see there is it alters one, not only the time and retention, right? Which we look at most of the, the 
the Poliquin stuff would break down these qualities in terms of total time and attention and organically changes the, the reps as well as the intensity. And then subsequently the rest, it goes with it. But if I look at it from, okay, I'm going to go from one to 20 seconds of time retention to the equivalent in the, in terms of that transitional point to an accumulation block that will go into hypertrophy 40 to 70 seconds. So I'm looking about a 20 per second, 20 second gap from one training block to the next, which is going to create this like maybe eight to 15% intensity spike or drop. So no more than a 20 sec second change in terms of going from an accumulation block to an intensification block, and then no more than a 15% spike or drop in terms of intensity. We want to keep that bottom about roughly about eight, eight percent. And what that does is it allows us to take the residual from the previous training block and carry it over further. It also, it doesn't waste that first week. Cause one of the things that you find when you adhere to more block periodization style is this idea that week one is a complete mulligan. If it's too foreign or abstract for that client or athlete to go through, if they have no actual trade or carryover from the previous block, meaning they're doing singles at 90% and then all of a sudden going to sets of 20, that the, the learning curve, the physiological curve, everything is just massively steep and you're not going to get to any actual really high level stress until two, three weeks in that program. And then you're already behind the eight ball. So having a more gradual transition, but what that does and I know this probably feels like, all right, this feels like it's regressing back into more of a linear periodized model, right? Meaning that like, we're going to follow the traditional math to have high volume, low intensity to high intensity, low volume. And now we're getting to this like gradual slope. Yes and no. And when we talk about group and team dynamics, that you're always going to have to take on some sort of regression to the mean and managing the bell curve, that 10% low responder, 10% high responder, and 80% in the middle are going to be the predominant amount of focal point you need to make because that's going to be the biggest concentric circle. You need to kind of smooth out the edges from one training block to the next, that it can't have a huge spike and this violent slope either up or down, that we need to have some sort of consideration that the group needs to adjust to this in a very seamless manner, not necessarily this one-on-one. -on -one. And when you shrink down that group and you get to more individual like programming where I'm working with a professional athlete or I'm working with a very experienced strength athlete, I can be more aggressive with that transition, right? I can break that, that soft rule of 20 seconds of time and retention from one training block to the next, or roughly eight to 15% change in intensity from one training block to the next. I can be a little bit more sudden because traditionally at that point, you typically see they have more experience or more advanced and they can handle variation a lot better, right? The best thing about an elite level athlete is their adaptive rate, meaning that they can adapt quicker than normal human beings. That's why they are elite. And you see this time and time again, when you work with NFL athletes, they don't come into their off season training till about May or June. They essentially do nothing until May or June and they are in peak physical condition in four to six weeks, which is not like normal, right? Like us us mortals out there working our ass off every single day in order to make a, make a team. That's not what elite level athletes experience. And they're not good at like carpentmentalizing and like limiting their time and something. They're just better at adapting. They get stuff quicker, right? Like, you know, I, the same thing for a strength conditioning coach, right? Like I've written thousands and thousands and thousands of programs and you know, the time I can put into a program is less than a person in their first month of strength conditioning, right? So I don't have to go through the painstaking efforts of evaluating and going through all these different thoughts in my mind. I'm pretty clear on what I need to do. And I know I need to go to work on certain aspects and I just focus on what I, what can be successful. But the same thing with elite level athletes, they just adapt quicker. So being more aggressive with transition from one training block to the next makes more sense. And you find too, of like the the novelty of something for a elite level athlete and getting their attention every single two to three weeks makes a huge difference in their, and their perception of what that value is. And you're like, you know, that you're getting them pretty good for every three weeks. They're like, that was, that was unexpected. Or that was as our, our good friend, Justin Gilbert would say, escalated quickly, right? That was a, that was a very clear moment that don't forget, you know, just because you get good at this, I don't have something left in the bag to go out there and push you and get you a push past what you're normally comfortable with. But that in terms of that structure, you know, you got to look at this from my block person and my linear person, my mixed method person. And the only message I would tell you 
if you are a conjugate mixed method type of person is just to focus on, okay, at certain points, you look at that, you have three pieces of that pie between velocity or dynamic effort, max effort, and then repetition effort. And you could break that down on the qualities of power, relative strength, and then hypertrophy or muscular endurance. And then you look at that from the, the pie is going to be distributed to each one of those pieces a little differently based off your time in the off season. And when you're getting closer and closer to peaking, you should spend more, more time in that dynamic effort because that is most transitional to the actual preseason period. And you should look at that from the, what do I need to get the most from that dynamic effort period? The middle or the sandwich of my off season is going to be probably more relative strength or max effort. And then in the beginning, you're going to get into this bigger distribution towards muscular endurance. And that's just a simple matter of, hey, do I do more sets in that? Or do I allocate more time, whether it's a density-based thing? So I want to do, I want to do maximal effort sprints, which is going to be this one to six, even upwards to one to 12 work to rest ratio. Might take me 10 to 15 seconds to do a max effort sprint. I'm going to need a three to four minute break. Okay, well, then I look at that from, that's going to take a big piece of the pie. And when do I want that big piece of the pie really dominating my program? Maybe I want that later. And that would be what I would say in terms of organizing stuff. It's, it's almost a similar approach on that, like you're just going to distribute time differently based off the quality you're trying to express at that point in the off season and having a rationale from a transition from one training block to the next. As we bring it back to, to our mere mortals, uh, not thinking of the more advanced athletes with that violent transition, does that apply to implements and like positions and stuff too? So yeah, yes, uh, answer your question directly, yes. But what I would go into is the potential for external load. Mm -hmm. And there are certain exercises that have a much higher propensity for external loading. And, you know, simple look at back squats would be able to sustain more external load than an overhead squat, right? That is a extreme example. Or overhead press for the flat bench or a neutral grip pull-up versus a, a pronated grip pull-up or a snatch grip deadlift, comparatively speaking to a trap bar deadlift, right? One is going to have a higher mechanical advantage, better positional strength, altered range of motion, that they're always following this continuum of like low external load or high external load doesn't make it less CNS, but it does make it a big impact on, on actual, what they call training intensity or systemic loading. And systemic loading has a unique in, impact on the skeletal structure, on the nervous system, on a whole host of other things that are more than just the muscular outcome. And, you know, there's a premise is why isometrics get so much, so much, I guess, traction is because the, what we see in terms of impulse and force produced during that in terms of Newtons is, is as high, if not way higher, which we know it's way higher than using traditional external load. And I think that's always been my case of like, if it was just a systemic load thing, why not just put them on a leg press? Like, I never really grasped the concept of, of it has to be the heaviest loaded compound closed kinetic chain exercise. Like if it's, if it's about systemic load, then it comes down to, we don't need necessarily need to be in a, a closed kinetic chain environment all the time. And when we think about the forces placed on a system during isometric loading, whether it's a overcoming, probably more overcoming than yielding then you see like that, okay, the systemic load we put feel from that would probably be superior to anything we're experiencing during a back squat. Like, let's say that we're going to do a max quarter squat and isometric position, and we see higher levels of force output during that than a traditional back squat. And then, yeah, if it's systemic loading, go to the one that has, go, has greater overall force output. And that to me is thinking about this, how wow, it gets into the organization, the structure of your training is the, if it is relative strength focus and we want to get as high amount of relative strength, which is strength relative to one body mass, which is different than absolute strength, just a increasing external load, then having this governor approach of if I can front squat two times my body weight, is that more or less impressive than someone who can back squat two and a half times their body weight? And yes, there's greater external load on the back squat, but in truth, the relative strength is probably better based off of the difficulty of a front squat relatively speaking to a back squat. Take it a step further, looking at a thing like bilateral deficit and the ability to do a split squat with 100 pounds in each leg and only be able to front squat 175 pounds. Like, and 
in the premise of bilateral deficit, the cumulative, the, the cumulative weight of that 100 and 100, which would be 200, is greater than 175. So bilaterally distributed, we're holding 200 pounds. That is, in fact, a theory. And we think about that from a level of, if it's systemic load and we look at it from force output or the overall like aggregate load, which gets into this idea of tonnage, and then there's a lot to be said about the whole host of ways we should organize and sequence our exercise. And one of the things that we find for a more conjugate structure is a leverage exercise variation more so than probably intensity. It's always maximal expression of intensity with a alteration of a exercise. And I think that's probably the best thing about a conjugate nonlinear periodized program is this idea of training to full maximal threshold failure intensity. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that's so paramount to long-term success is getting to threshold safely and effectively over a period of time. And when you're maxing out every single day, your window of opportunity for that set exercise becomes smaller and smaller versus a Kaizen method of progressive overload over weeks. Then you get into this like dynamic of, I need to adjust that exercise in order to keep this wheel or this train moving forward. You see the burnout rate, you see the breakdown rate pretty quickly on that strategy, but it, it doesn't change the simple fact of you can alter overall intensity or systemic load by managing the exercises that we choose on one day versus the next or one mesocycle to the next. And that makes, in a lot of ways, like the exercise selection as important as the variable selection. And then the variable selection has to have some sort of synergy and harmony with the exercise that you're choosing. Sorry, I got the bell coming on right here. So if we had to bring it down to its basic level, have a plan, you know, don't have those aggressive jumps unless you're working with advanced athletes and conjugate is stupid. Does that pretty much uh, sum it up yeah. there? That's it, man. Anyone who's doing conjugate training, yeah. grow up, you know, yeah. be, I'm a what real fan and do real coaching. <laughs> All right, Tim. That was great. Okay, Thank you very much. Conjugate, conjugate team out there. Just call me out, man. Yeah. They don't know. Well, I'm they right do here. Know. I'm right they here. Yeah. I'm at me. Come, Come on, at me. I'm right here. Let's get the Come debate with your low bar bat squat and your and your sumo deadlifts and your arch bench, you know. Like, once you flatten your bar, flatten your back on the bench, once you put the bar in front, and once you go ahead and get your knees inside your hands, like a like a real strength coach. Keep the squat where it's supposed to be in the quads, you know? It's not that hard. No doubt. No doubt. Oh, you feel that in your low back and your posterior chain? Sick. That's wrong. Yeah. Idiot. Idiot. Dumb dumb. All right, Jim. I'll see you.